Welcome to the Lift Heavy Run Long podcast. My name is Wilson Horrell and my co-host is Vaughn Rawls. You can find us at www.liftheavyrunlong.com or on Twitter and Instagram at Lift Run Long. Or feel free to email me directly at wilson at liftheavyrunlong.com. The mission of LHRL is simply this, to inspire and be inspired. Tune in every week as we speak with some of the world's most interesting people. Enjoy the show and find your bliss. LHRL Podcast, Episode 20, with Mr. Stu Shulman. Stu is a three-time Ironman finisher and will be attempting his fourth Ironman in the upcoming months. Stu was referred to us by our good friend Josh Otero, and we are pleased to have had the opportunity to sit down and speak with Stu about his journey to becoming an Ironman. Stu is one of these people who is just naturally inspiring. He's got a great heart. He's a good guy. He works a lot with philanthropy and has a giving soul. Stu will be the first to tell you that his road to becoming an Ironman athlete was not an easy one. He's the kind of guy who champions the underdog and is capable of blocking out the naysayers. Stu has been told most of his life that he was unathletic, too slow, not strong enough, and his time would be better spent doing other things. He chose not to listen to these people, and it has paid off in a big way. Enjoy. I think we have Stu. There he is. What's up, Stu? Here, Stu? Here I am. How you doing, guys? Stu Shulman, how are you? I am excellent. How about you? I'm doing just fine. Am I? Did I pronounce that right, Shulman? Perfect. All right. Perfect. And you and you said Stu as well. Stu is what I prefer. Only mom gets to call me Stuart. So. I understand that. It is. Yeah. <laughs> how are you, Stu? I'm awesome. It's a beautiful, but it's a little hot and steamy here in Minnesota, but. Uh, other than that, it's a beautiful day outside the window. How about you guys? We're doing great. Really, really hot and steamy down here in the south. I know it well. I used to manage that area. You're basically a suburb of um, of Memphis, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I used to work down there a lot in a prior life. So I know hot and humid down there as well. It's nasty. I'm stuck in a little box. My, my office is in my shop, and it's probably, I don't know, five by... 10 or 15 and I, and I had the window unit going as hard as it would possibly go. And then I turn it off and hope that I don't, uh, hope that I don't heat myself out of here before the conversation. So, so if I start sweating, uh, you'll know what's, what's going on. I'm out of AC. That's all good. Sweating is good. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself, Stu. Well, what would you like to know first? Uh, I, I want to know, first I want to know, was that you that I saw on YouTube talking to the children at candlelight it is that was me was that you that was great oh thank you thank you um, I think that uh, as I get get older um, I learned that that I need to be spoken to as if I was younger and <laughs> I, the kids were captivated by what you were saying and, and I was captivated the way that you put it to a group of you know eight to twelve year olds was the way that that people need to talk to me Thank you. Well, and, and that, that, um, that was a camp I spoke at uh, with patients who, who live with seizures every day. Um, we call them maybe epileptic, epileptic patients, if you're familiar with that nomenclature, but they, they have seizures. And um, a lot of those children are told that they can't. And um, what, I, what I remember most about that is there was one or two children in particular who were finding that, that connection to, I, in fact, can. And... Uh, so yeah, that 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 story is um, it it always it, it's it's with me always for sure. That's a powerful and necessary connection that I think all of us need to make in our lives is that that we can. Yeah, yeah. And so tell us how you got. You're a three-time Ironman, four-time Ironman. So three-time Ironman. Uh, I guess as I'm sitting here in my office, you see those posters behind me. That's one from each of the Ironman I did in Arizona. So I'm from Philadelphia originally. I should probably maybe back up. Uh, from Philadelphia, uh, moved to Arizona in 2010, and I currently reside in Minneapolis. My career took me across the country. Arizona is where I met Josh Otero, um, 
and uh, and he and I became very close friends. But uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of the story. But uh, Arizona Iron Man, um, it's so weird. It's a brand, right? I mean, people people make fun of people that get the Iron Man tattoo, but the Iron Man brand, it does kind of. Uh, it flows through my blood a little bit because it, it means much more than just an entity that makes someone or a company a lot of money. Um, the journey that it provided is, um, and still can, uh, you know, provides me is, um, is invaluable. So yes, I'm in about a month. I do Ironman Wisconsin. So now that I live up in, in Minnesota, Wisconsin is the next closest one. So that's where I'll be. So tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about your first Ironman story. Like, where did it start? How did you How did you get there? What made you want to do it? That kind of thing. Yeah. So, growing up in Philly, um, you know, we tell it like it is in Philly. I don't know how how much time you spent on the East Coast, but there's very little sugar coating, and people accuse me of that actually in my in my business life as well. Um, we don't sugar coat too much. Um, the side effect of that as a young child growing up is you can be, you can feel pretty beat down as a young child. I was, uh, I probably looked like a lot of kids now. Um, I wouldn't have called myself obese, but certainly way overweight. Um, ironically, I was very active. I was not, this is back in the days. I'm an old man now, Atari and in television were my games, right on. uh, you're right. And, uh, in fact, in television was my game for sure. Um, but I played a lot of baseball, a lot of basketball. I was very active, and I was actually quite good. Um, but I was a, I was kind of the pudgy fat kid in the group, and um, and I wasn't fast, and I was criticized for it. In fact, I was told I actually was taught to hit to right field, um, so which is a difficult thing for a young kid to do if you're a right-handed batter because you have to learn how to hit the opposite way. Part of the method to that madness was. The right fielder was all where was where all the the weak kids could you know were put, and therefore um, a slower guy could run around the bases before the ball would get thrown to home. So things like that, um, things like being told, Stu, you're not an athlete, so give it up. Um, you know, yeah, yes, you have power, yes, you have some skills, but man, you are so slow, slow as molasses. I was called at a very young age, and no one ever told me. Uh, that I could, in fact, fulfill my dreams of being an athlete. I mean, what little boy who was into sports doesn't at some point think I could be a pro football or baseball player? I mean, that's, that's you know, kind of how, how we're wired. Um, and at a very young age, those little dreams were crushed. Um, and, I, and I don't say so. Um, I'm not trying, trying to be over dramatic. I, it was crushed. Um, but I'm of the mindset that we all have a little spark of that little kid inside of us. And I don't care if you're a successful athlete or, you know, a businessman today, or, um, you know, if it's, if it's been part of who you are for your whole life, but we all have probably a spark somewhere where a fire was virtually extinguished, but a spark still exists. And my journey to becoming an Ironman started, um, as a young adult, I was, um, I owned my own business in Philadelphia. I owned a bar, uh, like a neighborhood bar in Philadelphia. And it was during that time where I was becoming more and more, I went from kind of a chubby kid to then a, a big boned adult. We would call me big boned. Um, I was one of those guys that would go around saying, I am just, I'm not built to run. I'm not supposed to run. I don't have small bones, my knees. I have two herniated discs in my back, which I do. Um, I was kind of a chronically in pain person going for shots in my back. And I had every excuse to tell myself and my friends and family why I couldn't do certain things. And how, I'm sorry to interrupt. How yeah. old are you at this point? So I'm in my, my young twenties. I, I convinced a, a bank at the time to give a 23 year old a loan to buy a bar. My first big sell of my career. <laughs> uh, and it actually was a good investment for that, for that bank. But wow, I don't know what they were thinking. Um, but yeah, at the age of 23, I was, you know, the lifestyle of a bar owner. I was picking up kegs wrong. I was kick, you know, picking up five or six cases of beer at a time and just using my back and doing all kinds of things where I had two herniated discs and I didn't want to be very active after that. And, um, uh, I was eating a lot of fried foods. It wasn't even about drinking beers. It was just the lifestyle of a bar owner that is not conducive to health. And, um, 
we had a, a personal experience in our lives where my, my wife was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis around that time. So here we are, now mm -hmm. we're newly married, 25, 26 years old, and within a couple of years, my wife was diagnosed. And here I was, now I'm, you know, I'm about six foot tall, I was about two, I wouldn't step on the scale, I was at least 250, I happen to think I was 260 to 270, I wouldn't step on the scale at the time. I was in denial, um, thinking I'm just a big dude, everyone called me Big Stu, you know, double extra large was, was my normal size, and in fact I kind of preferred a triple extra large on a, if I wanted a little room. And, um, and I was okay with that. To me, that's just part of being a big dude, you know? And uh, when my wife was diagnosed, something clicked. I observed her taking a diagnosis that could crush an individual spirit. Um, and she had all the reasons to, to use her experiences and her, what she was experiencing as, as a crutch, quite honestly. And yet she wasn't doing that. She was going to the gym. She was eating healthier and healthier, and here I was, getting heavier and heavier, and finding excuses why I should not work out, and why I should not be that athlete. And I bring it back to that story as a child, where that fire was kind of almost, but not fully extinguished, where I knew I could be an athlete. I knew I had it in me to be that guy, and I think psychologically, um, I just went, I overcorrected the other way and became an unhealthy person. So that was the, the beginning of my journey, and, and I do tell my wife all the time that she's very much my inspiration. She's very much why um, I am now a three-time Ironman and, and about to become, hopefully, uh, number four, a four-time Ironman because of observing her dedication, um, her no-excuses mentality. She doesn't complain, yet she has every reason to. So now when people tell me I don't run, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I can't run, I have a bad back, I have bad knees, I'm not built for running. Um, I'm okay with you not running. Just don't tell me you can't. It's you won't. And just say it. I won't do it. And that's fine. There's pain associated with having bad knees and a bad back. I have two herniated discs. I've gotten shots in my back. I have all the, I have every single excuse I've heard, I've used. Um, but there was a time where I said, no longer will I say I can't. It will either be I won't or I will. And that's kind of where I'm at now. It sounds like that your life growing up and the um, suppression or the discouragement that you had was necessary and vi very vital to your success. You know, it's nice that you say that. My parents would probably be thrilled to hear you say that um, because I think probably, you know, I don't know that they would. Um, yes, I, I, to answer your question, it probably is. It's made them the maniac that exists in front of you today. I have to come to work and put a, a collared shirt on every day and, and look nice. But um, there is definitely a maniac that lives inside of me that loves to go out and play and have some fun. Um, and you're right. I don't know that it would have manifested itself this way. Um, so for good or bad, I would argue, I think if I could rewrite the story, though, I would have been taught to think differently at a younger age, would have been coached more and encouraged versus um, extinguished. Absolutely, I was not suggesting that that's, oh, yeah. a, that, the, that that's the way to go about uh, yeah. something like that. You, having that maniac inside you, do you find that you enjoy playing with that monster, that that's something that you've become uh, addicted to and, and you're glad to, to have it come out when it's time to come out? Yes, and it's not always a good thing, my wife would tell you as well, but yes, that that monster loves to come out and play, and, and I definitely embrace a go hard or go home mentality. It's, um, you know, people say to me, um, I want to run a 5K, and I think, by the way, a 5K is freaking amazing. Heck, a run around the block is amazing. Good for you. They think that they have to, people sometimes think they have to be in the same circle as me as doing a marathon or an Ironman. Um, no, but, but the way my animal comes out is an extreme. I'm an all-or-nothing person. Call me very Philadelphian, which, by the way, is very, it's a very Philadelphia way to, to think. Um, but part of that beast that lives inside of me is if we're going to do this, we're going to shock the world, and we're not going to just be an athlete. We're going to do something that is so weird and that so many people would tell you you couldn't do, and we're going to do it, and we're going to smile the whole way doing it. So... Um, and I take that passion with whether it's athletics or work or, or 
hanging with my friends. We, uh, you know, we kind of go big or go home. So, I love. Go ahead, Vaughn. So um, you just you picked an Iron Man, so you decided to just stepping back a little bit. Yeah. I mean, what 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 races or what what other events did you do before that? Did you just pick an Iron Man, say that's what I'm going to do? Um, how did you train for it? That kind of thing. What Great was question. that? What did day one look like for you? Man, day one was Stu needed to start walking. <laughs> um, so I and I needed inspiration. I I'm a firm believer that. Usually there's something, there's a moment that, that allows someone to kind of commit, that allows the, it goes from this is a chore to this is something I need to do. And like I told you before, I think my wife was, is a very big piece of that. Um, so I used her as my motivation and I, and, and frankly her and, and multiple sclerosis as my platform. And I signed up for a 50 mile walk, which is I mean, at that point in my life, 50 mile walk, are you kidding me? It, it sounds big just to say it now, but as an overweight big dude who hadn't been working out in a long time, that was insurmountable. And I trained. So it was literally a 20 mile, a 50 mile walk broken up into three days, 20, 20, and 10. And it was seriously getting a pair of running shoes, which I didn't own and starting to walk. And, and I'm telling you guys, walking was hard. I mean, I seriously, I had to put myself on a on a, um, a regimen of so many miles per day and at this pace. And it was, it was quite a big deal that manifested in itself. Um, as my career was starting to, um, to change and progress as I got into sales and sales leadership, I was traveling a lot and walking was not always conducive to the city I was in. Or maybe I was in a downtown area or I was in a sketchy area. So I would use the hotel gyms and I would start with, if the treadmill was, was taken, I would do the bike. And then I signed up for the MS 150, which is a very popular ride in Philadelphia where you go from downtown Philadelphia to the Jersey shore. Um, and that's a 150 mile bike ride over the course of two days. So then that kind of became leg two. And I thought, all right, now I'm doing some long bike rides. I've done my first, what we call a century ride, a hundred mile bike ride. I don't know. What if I did this thing called a triathlon? And then I went back to the square one. Let's start with a sprint, Olympic. Um, and then all of a sudden it became real. I don't know. If I can do an Olympic, I could do a half Ironman. Did that, and it just manifested into let's let's go big or go home, baby, and and um, and let's do the full. And uh, and that's kind of where I've I've just landed. It's just. It's my. It's the most painful thing that I've ever gone through. Now three times, um, and it's a it's a pain that I like to tell people I get to experience. I, I you would never experience this pain unless you do one, um, and it's a very special pain. And the joy of crossing that finish line is is um, exponentially higher than the pain that you feel. What do you think was the most difficult part? of your between getting started and becoming an iron man the reason i asked this is yesterday i was running with a friend and they said that they were trying to get up to the point to where they could run a mile without stopping mm -hmm. and i told them how difficult i believe that to be and in looking back at my training that going from zero to running one mile without stopping was more difficult for me than any other interval in between running a, a 50 mile race. Yeah. That one mile to a 5k was easier. 5k to a 10k was easier. 10k to a marathon was easier as a whole physically and mentally than getting to where I could get off the couch, walk, maybe jog from light post to light post to running a mile. Yeah. I would agree. You know, you think about all the, all the things your body has to go through. It goes from, um, in my case, a very kind of stagnant way of life to movement and movement equals irritation, right? And irritation I think of as a good word and it's also a bad word. Irritation could be bad like blisters. When I think of a new runner, I had lots of blisters. I had pains. Um, shoot, I hadn't sweat so much in so many years and that was a big old pain and my 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 heart rate was just sky high. It was it hurt, you know, to go off for a run and you get that feeling in your lungs like I don't know, my lungs gonna explode and I didn't know why that was happening. So I would I would agree. It's 
it's going through that initial irritation, both physical and mental, that is so difficult. The beauty about irritation, though, is it forces change, and it, it forces you to land in a camp. And I chose the camp that said, I'm going to land on the other side of this irritation and what I viewed as the positive side um, versus going back and reverting back to, to the old stoop. Yeah, it's almost like after you get over the fear of experiencing the irritation, then you're going after the irritation. Yes. You get to a point where you want to go find that. Oh, absolutely. And that's where, you know, my fantasy football league, I, uh, I call <laughs> the team name is Embrace the Pain. Um, there's a point at which you you almost look for and, and give the pain a big old hug um, because you know if you're there you're growing if uh, you know if we're always winning and everything is easy well then you never actually win right you never change not there's never a, a moment of victory so you have to embrace the pain to get to the other side and see what's there well tell us how what are the numbers in an Ironman how far is Ironman? Yeah. So an Ironman is a triathlon. I just had this conversation at lunch with someone who was asking me. It's a triathlon. There's way. There's many, many different distances of a triathlon. There's a sprint distance. There's an Olympic distance like they do in the Olympics. And then you see when you see those stickers on a car, it says 70.3. That's a half Ironman distance. And then the full Ironman distance, which is 140.6 miles. So that is a swim of 2.4 miles a bike ride of 112 miles, and then a full 26.2 mile uh, marathon run afterwards. And an Ironman is a brand, just like Nike and Coca-Cola, we all have brands. Ironman is a brand, but the distance is what we equate to of, um, as an Ironman. How the hell do you figure out that you can swim 2.4 miles? Yeah, I was going to ask the same thing. <laughs> like, for me, that, that's the most challenging part about triathlons. <laughs> Bar none, like. Well, and I tell people all the time, so I'm, I sit in front of you now, I'm 41, 40, no, I'm, what am I, 42 years old, I wish I was younger, I'm 42, and um, I only learned how to swim at the age of 34, 33, um, so at that age, I mean, I, don't get me wrong, at that age, I could, I, could, I could do better than a doggy paddle, but I didn't know how to breathe, I didn't know anything about proper swimming technique, and it started with getting in the pool and asking my wife, who happened to have been a high school swimmer, to show me proper breathing technique. And we were on vacation, and we were at the hotel pool, and I said, just do me a favor, just show me how. And she showed me, within 10 minutes, I said, okay, I'm done, I, I don't need any more lessons from you, now I just gotta get in there and, and practice it. Um, I developed horrible form, um, but it ultimately, it led me down to my first lap in the pool, which, by the way, I, I thought I ran a marathon by the time I, I finished that lap in the pool. Um, it was the most difficult thing ever. Um, I, I still feel that way. And I don't, I, uh, yeah, yeah it, it, it's practice, and, and, it, and it's rhythm. And what I learned over the years, I've had some great coaches. Um, and actually, you know, literally, I had a swim set eccentric coach. His name is Frank Soule, an amazing swim coach in Arizona who taught me proper technique. And that technique um, has led me to being able to swim 2.4 miles because believe it or not, for me, the goal of, of getting out of that water is to not feel fatigued. So say that in a sentence, I'm gonna go swim 2.4 miles yet not feel fatigued when I get out of the water. Um, and that all comes down to technique. It's getting your body in a rhythm where it's, it's moving but not pushing to um, – so that it, it can set me up for a successful bike and ultimately run. Yeah, it's did, practice. Did you, have a, did you have a coach throughout, even leading up to your first Ironman? Did you have a coach going into that? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I, I did have a coach once in Philadelphia for six or eight weeks. It, it turned out to be more of a camaraderie training group. Um, my first coach was when I moved out to Arizona, and I knew that – these long distances were something I wanted to tackle. Um, you know, life is about people you meet and networking, and, um, and I met Frank. And it was until then that I realized for two reasons. One, number one, I needed technique coaching, but I also needed, um, I needed a coach just in general, right? I needed someone to not only help me through the, the physical progression of what I was about to do, but the mental piece as well. 
it, it is a difficult task, and I don't care if it is a 5K uh, or an Ironman. These are big challenges for people, and sometimes it, it hurts. It hurts to train. It hurts to – you don't want to train. You don't want to get out of bed. Um, shoot, you certainly don't want to get out of bed at 3 or 4 in the morning. And, um, and there's a mental battle that takes place, and your coach, at least my coaches over the years, have, have taught me um, about – not only the physical piece, but the mental piece. My, my current coach, his name is Mike Bunting in, in here in Minneapolis. Um, I think more than anything, I get, I get a lot of great perspective and, and mental coaching from him. So it, it's amazing what we, um, you know, what it takes, the team of people you can surround yourselves with and, and who helps you along the way. There's a lot that goes into lift heavy, run long that really has nothing to do with lifting heavy or running long as much as it is a vehicle towards living a good life and being happy with yourself and building some confidence and, and finding out that you can do a lot of things that, like you said, you're told that you, that you can't do and you believe that you can't do. And so some people will approach me and they, they're insecure about, well, I don't lift heavy and I don't run long. And I try to explain that, that heavy and long are, are relative terms. Mm -hmm. You know, long is, is further than you're comfortable running and right. heavy is, is whatever weighs a lot to you. And I guess what I'm interested in is how the, how's the Ironman, uh, come into your life aside from finishing an Ironman, your, your energy and your happiness and, and your passion for just living. It's, it's, that's a deep question. You just asked me, it's, it's very much a, a part of who I am. Um, if you ask my children, so after, you know, you, you do these, I've done these three now, and, but after each one, uh, we have family meetings before I sign up for one. This is a big, this, me crossing that finish line is not just about Stu. It, to the outsider, it might feel like it's about Stu, um, but it's really not. I have a team of people, and that team starts with my wife and my children. And we have a meeting because it's without... Iron Man, Stu is a different guy. Um, and that's what I mean about the, you know, it, it's funny. I'm talking about a brand, but it's it's the journey that I've been on now three times. Now, well, four, really. I'm about to compete in number four. It's it's one that um, that continues to teach me. Um, it, 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 I learn from the process, um, and it reminds me of very valuable life lessons that I then take to my personal life. And my kids tell me, Dad, you're a different you're a different guy when you're training um, for the better it's not that when I'm not training I'm a bad dude or something it's just my inspiration um, my passion for things um, as 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 much as life is hectic when you're training when you're training for anything um, heck it, it, it's a big deal to, to squeeze a half hour of workout working out and uh, working out for people um, if you can squeeze that stuff in the way that correlates to other areas of your life, it's just, it's phenomenal what it does. It pushes you to new efforts. Some of my most successful careers in business were, were years when I was training, um, training for these big things. So it absolutely translates. Uh, my kids would tell you, my wife would tell you I'm a different person when I compete and when I train. Um, and, and frankly, I think it, it, it teaches it teaches others around you. It, it, it demonstrates commitment. It demonstrates passion. It demonstrates fight. It demonstrates um, the ability to push uh, for something you believe in. And sometimes that, that thing that you believe in is yourself. It's not even the race. Um, so I think there's a lot of things that, that ultimately um, that you show others in your commitment, whether it's running around the block or, or doing a crazy Ironman or something even bigger than that. What a gift. What a gift to, for you to have the self-awareness and the knowledge that there, there is another Stu, and that Stu's not, not as pretty as the one that, that there, it's here when, when he's training, and I'm the same way. I know that there's, a, there's another me, and, and he, he's not real good. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think that a lot of people are just kind of stuck with they're just they have the knowledge that that's just who they are and yeah. they're stuck in being who they are and that's that's the saddest thing in the world is not believing that you don't have to be that person at all if you're not happy with that person if you are then that's fantastic but if you're not there's a completely different animal down in yeah. there 
I, I, I completely agree. We, in our society, we do a really good job of beating ourselves up. And, mm -hmm. and, and frankly, the, I, I read somewhere and I, and I wish I just wrote the quote down, but the probably, you know, we beat ourselves up more than any bully or, or, you know, anyone else, our parents, our friends over the years have beat us up. And how dare we do that to ourselves? So if you want to put yourself into a camp then put yourself into that camp, but don't beat yourself up. Um, you need, we need all the friends we can get in this world. And, and the first one you should have is, is you, right? You should Absolutely. be your biggest cheerleader. So, yeah, what you just said rings very true to my heart as well. Well, we take such a hard approach to ourselves, much harder than anybody else seems to, to come after us. I, I have a fear of people coming after me as hard as I come after myself. And mm -hmm. you were talking about, uh, you know, how important it is for somebody to, um, you know, you don't compare people to being an Iron Man you compare people to whether they're willing to get up and walk around the block. And this weekend, my, me and my wife and my father are going to run this, this Elvis 5K here in Memphis. And he's almost 70 years old. And the first place that he goes is, well, I, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to embarrass you. I'm so slow. You're not even going to really want to ride out there with me. And it's going to, you know, just, just beating himself up. And I'm just so proud of the guy for getting out and, and, doing something different. It's so hard to do anything different. And it sure as shit ain't easy being 70 years old and doing something different. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's phenomenal. And, and what a, what a great thing, you know, and it's, it's a shame that, so here, you know, your father's about to do something that is so, so amazing yet still even we, we, we self deprecate, right. And we, we almost discourage ourselves and what a shame because it's such a special thing he's doing. And that's what we're trying to build with Lift, he yeah. Lift Heavy Run Long is a group of people that, that we have the, the Ironmen, we have the 100-mile racers and the 50-mile racers, and we want to welcome and encourage the, the one-mile walkers, yeah. you know, and the people that are, are trying to do it because there's a lot of reasons to do things other than getting a medal. Absolutely. Yeah, finishing first is never my, my goal. Is, is it a nice to? Sure. But that's not why I do it. It's about the personal growth. It's about... It's about feeding my own self-esteem, which over the years was beat down pretty bad. Um, it's about feeding Stu and, uh, and frankly, therefore, my family and, and my friends. And um, I, to me, it's the, the best give you, the gift you can give yourself is to, is to challenge yourself, accept the challenge, and, and don't care about what anyone else thinks. Well, in that video that I watched of you talking to the, those kids, it was funny to me that a, uh, a, a 40 year old's approach or, or question was not any different than a 10 year old's question. When, when one of them, when you said that you were doing it again and, and the kid said, but why man, that hurts. That's a lot of pain. Why do you want to go through all that pain? And what, what did I say? I don't recall. Uh, you said that that's, that's what it's about. It is. You know, that, that, that there's also a side of you that, that's crazy, and mm -hmm. you need that crazy, and you feed that crazy, and, and that crazy is what helps you have the, the fulfillment in your life and, and that it gives you a lot of pleasure. It really does, and that's, that's where I was going back to my embrace the pain. Um, I'm telling you, in about a month, the pain I'm going to go through is one that I will be saying in the moment, this sucks, and why did I do this? And no, and I'm never doing this again. Um, but boy, that's a special feeling. And it just, it, it's amazing how much I rely on those experiences now to my everyday, including in the business world. When I, when I have a tough customer, a tough client, uh, you know, someone who's not getting and it's painful, you know, mentally it's painful. It, it just doesn't, not working today. Um, it's those experiences that help that have, you know, help me give me the correct perspective. It pain is a wonderful thing. Without pain, there's no growth. There's no irritation. Back to that word. Um, it's it's a wonderful thing. We shouldn't always resist pain, right? Um, and I and I hope you understand what I mean by that. It's pain is not good per se. In that uh, I would never want just to hit myself with a hammer or something to experience pain. But the kind of pain we're talking about is one that you can um, you can push through and learn from. And that pain is very, very special.
Well, it's nice to know what it feels like to not be hitting yourself with a hammer right. after you've hit yourself with a hammer for long enough. There you go. Did you ever believe that anyone else's inspiration or, or hope or energy would be contingent upon what it is that you're doing? I mean, I clearly you have to know that you know if you give up, if you don't continue what what you're doing, there's people out there that are watching you that are are following your lead. Well, and, and quite frankly, that's that's why, well, for a number of reasons, that's why I was using multiple sclerosis as a platform, right? Um, number one, I wanted to do something to support my wife, my inspiration. And and by the way, her, my wife's brother, my brother-in-law also has MS. I wanted to do something to support him. But ultimately, the biggest step, perhaps the most painful step to go back earlier, uh, it wasn't even strapping on the shoes and getting the blisters, it was, for me, it was telling people what I was about to do because I'm a man of my word. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Telling myself, I could lie to myself, and over the years, I think we do, we do a really good job of lying to ourselves and we put ourselves down, but I can't lie to someone else. So I could tell myself, I'm going to start eating healthy. I'm going to start exercising, and if I disappoint myself, I can live with that. What I cannot do is disappoint a friend. I cannot disappoint someone who, who has put their trust in me, and even worse, their their you know, or not worse, but differently, their money, and so that's why I ask people to support MS. Um, so for me to pick a cause that was near and dear was important to me, because I was not going to let the people down that were going to support me, both emotionally, nor was I, I was I going to do it financially, um, and to me that was one of the big things that that got me over the edge because it would have been very easy to say, I'm going to start running. My wife is inspiring me. Um, but if I didn't go through with it, no one would have been the wiser. The moment I put it out there on Facebook, the moment I, I said, Hey everyone, please donate. Let's, let's raise a 500 bucks or a thousand dollars. And I had people actually do it. Well, now I'm on the hook. And, uh, and then once you're there, it, it's, um, you know, there's, there's no going back. So, you can't disappoint other people either. You accountability, go ahead, is, accountability is a huge thing. It's a, it's, and everybody needs it. And I, I try to tell people um, a lot about uh, when they're trying to reach their goals. You know, you need to tell somebody what you're going to do yes. you know, and commit to it because once you do, um, that you're going to be more likely to uh, be successful. And not only that, but um, I, I've been on several long runs myself and kept myself going because I can tell myself, Hey, I told so-and-so that I'm going to be doing this. I, I have to finish. I don't have a choice. You know, there's no, there's mm -hmm. no quit. And doesn't that work? It works the same way. Don't you, don't you agree, um, with your business and, you know, having a time where you commit to your friends, you know, I'm going to be there to not be there. It's like, it's embarrassing. And, um, that's why there's nothing to me more powerful and more motivating even than a, than a text thread that says, all right, are we all showing up or not? And if we are, you don't want to be that guy or that gal that doesn't show up. Um, well, so and that, you know, yeah. that's a, that guy or that gal is that same guy or that same gal just about every single time. An unreliable person is an unreliable person. Yeah. And somebody that, that moves their calendar and, and moves their meetings and moves their schedule consistently, they do that consistently. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're left with. And yes. you can either do that and, and have that reputation and be satisfied with that, or you can be somebody when they say, I'm going to call you at this time. You can expect them to call you at this time. I'm going to be here for this run. They're going to be here for this run. If they're not, their car is broken, something, something's up. Yes. And I heard you talking on a news interview, and I think that you made a, a very profound point when they asked you what the hardest part of the Ironman was, and you said registering, committing and, and registering, like you just said, verbalizing that you were going to do it. it was hard. Training is, is what it is, but it's not as difficult as, as hitting the send button and, and registering yeah. for the race. Putting, putting your, well, it's not putting your money where your mouth is. It's putting your mouth where your money is. I mean, again, anyone can sign up for a race. I've, I've known plenty of people. They sign up for a, a marathon. They drop 100 bucks or 200 bucks, and 
they just they want it, it, you know it's it's 200 bucks wasted so it's not putting your money where your mouth is it's putting your mouth where your money is i, I said i was going to sign up now i'm going to i got to do it i got to walk the walk um, it's a much different experience and yeah I, I need people to hold me accountable so i i announce things i i am um, i'm not a very public person in that i don't i don't like to be the center of attention um, so i don't announce things too often but even today to announce on Facebook that I was doing Madison, Wisconsin, Ironman, and I put, you know, um, I got my number. Here's my 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 badge. To me, it that's not, has nothing to do with bragging or letting people know. It's 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 an accountability piece. It's 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 something I need to do to hold myself accountable because I know um, with the amount of likes I get or the comments or the people that will now follow me. When I'm racing, I, I cannot let them down, and I and I and knowing that they're with me um, and their support will get me through. So there's always a method to the madness. Yeah, and you reach a point where it doesn't have anything to do with Stu. I, I remember doing signing up for the St. Jude Marathon, and I signed up for the uh, whatever the level was to to raise the money. And there was a side of me that was like. You know, I'm always on Facebook. I hate to sound so needy, and I hate to be asking people for this and that, and I just can't bring myself to send out that email. And then it occurred to me, this doesn't have anything to do with me or that marathon. This mm -hmm. is about, you know, raising money for those those kids. Yes. And sometimes that's a uh, that's a shot to the ego, and I just had to be made aware of that. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, yeah, you, and you bring up a good point. Sometimes in in my circle, there's there's some people that's we use. You know, charity and things like that as a platform for 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 our craziness, um, and and it gets hard because you keep thinking to yourself, can I ask my friends again? And you know, they already wrote me a check for twenty five dollars last year or a hundred dollars last year, and shoot, I don't want them to feel obligated. But we have to remind ourselves it's they might be doing it in part to support us, but um, we shouldn't own that burden. Um, if this is truly a platform, if you signed up for for that marathon, for the St. Jude's Marathon, for the purpose of helping others, then then damn it, do it. Help That's others, right? right? And, and you got to allow somebody else the good feeling that, that they get to have by, by writing that check. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's just tough finding out that it's not all about me sometimes. I know, right? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how the Iron Man has affected you professionally. Does that come into your professional life? It does. So if you think about that old Stu who was um, eating unhealthy, you know, et cetera, um, getting fit over the years has provided a channel of new interest for me, things like nutrition, um, exercise in general, and it's become a passion. My, my career over the years, I, I sold my bar um, and I went into the pharmaceutical business. Um, I like to tell people I went from drugs to alcohol, right? I mean, if I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> from alcohol to drugs. I messed up my own my own right. punchline, um, but that's what I did. I went, you know, went from the bar business to the pharmaceutical business, and um, in in a world at the time I hadn't lost a lot of weight yet, and in a world of beautiful people uh, in doctors' offices, you know, that was kind of the old stereotype: is you have to be a, a pretty woman uh, to walk into some of these offices to get time with a doctor. Here was Big Stu walking in, expecting time with the doctor, and um, yeah, you, you're not a pretty woman. Well, thank you, thank <laughs> you. I, I aim not to be, um, but I. Um, so it's it's just interesting how. But I, I felt like I was helping people for the first time. I was providing therapies that I knew were were changing people, and that's how my personal life was starting to parallel my professional life. Um, and then as I moved out to Arizona, I realized. As, and so here goes my career, right? So I went from a, a salesperson to a sales leader. Um, and I was, as I've been able to, to talk with people across the country and, um, and tell my story a bit and, and people see me, you know, it maybe had been a few months that they see me and they've seen me drop a few pounds and, um, and I get to tell them about another accomplishment, a personal accomplishment that comes out of conversation you can see it inspires people. How did you do that? And you find out that we're not all that different. We all do have a common bond. I don't care if you, you, you might look like you're in shape, but maybe you haven't run in forever, and that is something you, in fact, want to do. And um, ultimately led me down a path of wellness and, um, and, quite honestly, to become less dependent on things like drug therapies um, 
And so my career has taken to a place, not only did I, did I, did my career grow in the pharmaceutical company, but it also provided a path. It's amazing how energy works um, to where my passion is. And that is living a life um, that is hopefully as pain-free as possible, uh, meaning chronic pain and, um, and just overall health and wellness. And that's where I am now. So my, my career has moved me across the country. It has grown. Um, and now I, I feel like every day I go to work, um, I get to help people. And isn't that a wonderful thing? Was there a distinct point in your training or your life changed where self-love kicked in to where you went from being hard on yourself to more accepting yourself and, and loving yourself and, and finding that that was a, an easier and better way to live? It's a great question because I'll be honest with you, it's something I still struggle with every day. Um, when I look in the mirror, I'll be honest with you, I still see the 260-pound guy. Um, so I, so I'm very hard on myself. I still, I'm very critical of myself. Um, um, however, what I have gotten out of this experience also is an appreciation for what Stu can do. Realizing that, um, that Stu is a very, very, very powerful human being and can do way more than I had previously thought. So um, I'm, I'm still, I still, this is, this is, I'm still a work in progress. I still am my biggest critic, but, um, in many ways, um, I'm very proud of, of how far I've come. Do you, um, uh, on a personal level and, uh, regarding the people around you, because I, uh, I went through a, a big change myself where I was not athletic. I was fat, lost weight and all that. Have you noticed that now that, that you're different, that the people around you, your friends and pe and things like that treat you differently than they did before. Like on, on yeah. any level, maybe, maybe they don't, maybe they're, they, they're jealous on some sort of level and they just don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. Or maybe they are just so inspired by you that they want to spend more time with you or something like that. Well, I would say, um, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful. I don't know that anyone has ever kind of pushed me away. Um, I think there's people that think I'm a freak. <laughs> um, but I also like that. I kind of, uh, that's part of the animal that, that, that resides in me. I like being called a freak. If I'm not being freaky, then that means I'm doing something wrong. Um, however, there are people that over the years, it, it, it's weird. I, I prefer to be around certain people. How about that? Right. Um, so when I moved to Minneapolis, um, I was searching for what I found in Arizona when I moved out there. Um, I found like-minded people. I found people that helped get me into the Ironman triathlon and who would train on a hundred degree, you know, crazy hot day and go bike a hundred miles. Um, I needed, in order to find happiness in my life here in Minnesota, I needed to surround myself with people who thought similarly. And it wasn't until I surrounded myself with people who think similarly, but who also provide me um, irritation to grow that um, that I was happy. I didn't find happiness until I found that. Um, I, you know, just like you would tell your kids, I certainly tell my kids, you surround yourself with people that, you know, that you want to be around and that you would, uh, that you think highly of. And, and I need to surround myself with like-minded people. Otherwise, um, Stu's not a happy guy. I need people to, to push me and to be pushed. And um, so that, it's more about that. I think I was never pushed away. It's, I found the people that make Stu a bit easier to be around. Isn't it interesting how we're so quick to take truth and call it cliche in an effort to, to not change things. You hear people, you've heard that all your life. You know, you've heard surround yourself with positive people and surround yourself with good people. And you think, oh, that's just kind of Girl Scouts type stuff yeah. and, and things people say. Well, it's things people say because people say them because they work. It's true. And they're true. <laughs> and once you start doing some of those cliche things, you find that uh, they're cliche for, they become cliche for a reason. People yeah. don't say, say stupid things and, and they become cliche. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And yeah, and it's, um, it, it's just amazing. And yeah, so it gets to the point where, you know, you, we bring up this topic of, 
of surrounding yourself with the right people, with people that will motivate you. Um, you know, it, it's amazing. I, I, I tell my wife all the time, it, it's not that I, it's not that I necessarily don't like that person or those people we're going to, I don't know, we're going to go out to dinner with or something like that. It's, it's, I just can't be around those people. Um, there's a difference to me. I might like them, but I'm going to make a choice. I've come this far. Um, I have so many days, weeks, years left on this earth um, that I, I can only surround myself with positive people that are going to push me forward. I just don't have time to for social graces and just to kind of be around people that are going to um, not help me be who Stu needs to be. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And I have to be aware of people that make me feel indifferent. Yeah. I'm, I'm prone to think, well, if they make me feel indifferent, then that's fine. That's not at all fine because I don't want to live an indifferent life. Yeah. I mean, my, my defense will be, well, they don't hurt my feelings. They don't do anything wrong to me. But indifference is a, is a killer. I need people oh. that, that make me want to, like you said, that bring out the animal and, and make me just have to, have to want better, have to go and get better. Yeah, being in sales. I mean, and that that's what you're doing with, you know, with your business as well. It's it's sales, right? And and the worst thing you can come across is indifference. I would rather someone tell me that they don't like my program or they don't like something because now at least I know where they are. But indifference is like, shoot. I mean, pick a side, would you? And and that goes with the people I, I surround myself with. I, I would rather I would rather know I don't like you or love you rather than be indifferent. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there's a whole world full of apathetic people that have so much to offer, yes. and, and I need what they have to offer. And yes. I want that uh, as a on a selfish level. I want to see them get better because I need what they have inside of them, not just for yes. them, but for me. Yes, and and sometimes I try to include those people in my personal life. I I, I say, hey, I don't care if you haven't ridden a bike in 10 years. Let's go on a bike ride together because I believe in what you just said. Um, I, I want uh, There's a piece of, of inside of you that I want to come out that I want to experience. And um, I think with the state you're in, I don't know that I'm ever going to experience that. But maybe if we can, you know, if we can do something different, it doesn't have to be riding a bike. But, but that's the example. Um, let's get you to a place where maybe I can, I can tap into that and not only be the only, the beneficiary of that, but maybe you can experience some of that too. Because I, I do believe, um, no matter how positive a person you are in life or frankly, how negative you are, we all have stuff inside of us. We all have those little sparks, um, that, that need to be reignited that how dare we go through our lives without at least trying to reignite that that spark into a, a flame and then into a full you know blaze and I think it's important and I'm speaking for you you can tell me if I'm wrong but I think it's important for people to understand that that the Ironman and the 50 mile racer they need a, a walk around the block every once in a while too uh, oh yeah a one mile run can be just as important to somebody who's used to doing 20 and 30 of them as it'll be to the person who can't get out the door. Do me a favor. Tell that to my coach who has me doing like a hundred mile ride this weekend in a 20 mile run. I'm like, can I, can I please just go for a walk? Please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the point may be lost in that one. I don't think that your coach is going to go for that, but I, I understand the argument. <laughs> for I sure. Understand the argument. For sure. Well, Stu, man, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to us. Uh, you got a great story. You're very inspirational. You know, you came highly recommended th from Josh Otero. Uh, Josh was on the show two weeks ago, and he kept talking about an individual that was encouraging him to do all this stupid stuff over and over again, and, and Vaughn and I were talking. Were you that individual that kept getting him to sign up for these races? So I did watch that, by the way, um, uh -huh. and I don't think I was that guy. I know exactly who that guy is. Um, however, Josh and I, but it's interesting how our paths crossed. So when I moved to Arizona, I said, uh, to a, a mutual friend of, of Josh and mine, I asked him, um, I need someone who's a little bit crazy and who will do some miles with me and who will show me Arizona, you know? And he immediately said, I have to introduce you to Josh. And 
uh, Josh himself holds a very close um, place in my heart because he was one of the people that pushed me and got me and irritated me, uh, got me out of my comfort zone. There were many days where Josh, being the runner that he is, um, he was doing laps around me and he would say, Stu, you can do it. And he was encouraging and um, and ultimately he, he has a very big piece of, of some of these, these posters that are on the wall behind me here. Um, I'm not shy to say, so he's a special guy, but no, I'm not, I'm not that guy he was referring to. I know exactly who it is though. Well, he's a fantastic guy and, and that's kind of back to what we were talking about. It was nice to be pointed in the direction of you because we knew that you would be equally as fantastic because that's how, that's how the universe works. And, uh, you know, having somebody like him around and getting introduced to people like you, that's a path that's that's being blazed, and I'm fortunate to, to be on this side of it, and I hope that we'll keep in touch, and if there's ever anything that uh, we can do for you or uh, that you can do for us, then yes, uh, let's make that happen. I would love to. Gentlemen, the feeling is mutual. Really, I appreciate the time, and uh, and just thank you. It's, it's been great getting to chat with you, and now that we're connected, let's definitely stay in touch. Is there anything that you you would like to plug or any direction that you can point people to uh, anything that you have going on? Well, you know, so um, to plug, not necessarily. We're, we're doing some pretty amazing things at, at our company. It's called Moby. Um, MobyForLife.com is our website. It's a phenomenal company that's helping people dealing with chronic issues, um, chronic diseases, and um, we're doing some amazing things to help people that are, that are not um, they're not achieving the wellness that they're seeking, and they're seeking it from multiple providers and multiple uh, methods of medication. And um, and we think we have part of the missing piece here, and it's about self-management and um, and owning part of the solution yourself. So uh, not not as much of a plug as much of um, for those that that hear about this benefit that some of their insurance companies are providing. Uh, it's legit, it's real, and we're doing some great stuff. So, no, my plug is please cheer for me on uh, Ironman uh, Madison, Wisconsin uh, next month. Uh, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, you can check in. I'll be out there racing. So uh, at some point, um, any kind of uh, positive prayers or energy you can send my way, I'm taking it. You got it. Be sure to post that on the LHRL Athletes page on Facebook, so we can all encourage you and, and keep up with you. Would love to do it, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thanks, dude. Take Thanks. care. Take care.